Hello, thank you for coming. Um, I had to put a, uh, this talk is about looking at uh, dinosaur bone tissues under the microscope, which is a very like in the lab focused thing and I just wanted to establish that I had been outside at some point. <laughs> so. All right. <laughs> All right, uh, this is, um, Actually, it's probably my favorite dinosaur-themed graffiti. Uh, and I like it um, to kind of help us um, think about the type of science I do. Um, we have the dinosaur skeletons, and you've seen plenty of them downstairs, and there's a lot of information you can get about how the anatomy of a dinosaur was, like how, how tall they were. Um, you can look at some of them, and they seem like little, you know, big-ish tanks, I think was uh, what Michelle said in the last talk. Um, you can see some that look like they're long-legged and thin-legged. Uh, thin legged looks like they're really well-suited for running. Um, but there's a lot of the biology, there's a lot of the anatomy of these, uh, of these animals that you can't really get to just from the skeleton. Or if you do, you have to kind of use the, the skeleton in unique ways. Um, and so I'm a biologist by training, and I'm interested in a lot of the, the other aspects of these animals, things that you can't get from looking at the outsides of the bones alone. Um, so there are lots of questions that we can ask uh, using just that anatomy, the external parts of the, of the bones of the skeleton, you know, which was the first dinosaur, how many kinds, which was the tallest at any rate. Um, but there's a lot of things that come um, that you might want to know just how they were as, as critters. How did they live their lives? What noises did they make? What foods did they eat? Um, how smart were they? How do you tell boys from girls? How long did they live? Um, those are sorts of questions that, like I said before, um, you either have to use the skeleton in a unique way, like maybe using the CAT scanners uh, to look inside at those where those nerves are running through the skeleton, um, or you might have to build models based on aspects of their throat anatomy. Um, different ways to use the skeleton besides just looking at the outside features of those bones. Um, in my lab, I, I'm interested in these sorts of questions, and most of these are about how animals, um, dinosaurs and other you know, reptiles, mammals, animals in general, um, how they lived their lives, how long their lives were, uh, how fast they grew up, so how many years between when they, when they were born and when they became an adult. Um, when did they start having babies? So questions about the stories of their lives. We sometimes call that life history. Um, we have life stories too, right? We're born, we grow up, we ride alligators, we play football, <laughs> we get married, have kids, and uh, s some of us mate for life and, and live, a, live a long, happy life together. Um, animals have life stories too. Uh, you can be a cute kitten and then a destructive kitten and then a sort of, a, I don't know, a winky kitten and then <laughs> fall in love and uh, these ones are neutered so there will be no, no future kittens, sadly. <laughs> so I, I'm interested in telling these life stories for extinct animals um, and learning how life stories have changed. So if you think about a cat versus, uh, versus me, um, people you know, we take about 12 years to, go, to get to the point where we go through puberty, then we have a long, awkward adolescence. Um, we, you know, we're not adults until we're in our early 20s. Um, those, when, are, when in our lives are these major events happening? Uh, a kitten, you know, they're very cute for a couple months. Uh, they're ready to reproduce at six months, you know, and they, they can live maybe 15 years. So the scale of their life, the length of their story is different and proportionate uh, to what to the scale, to the length of their life, the big events in their life happen at different times. Um, one problem if we try to reconstruct these life stories for dinosaurs is figuring out, you know, just are we, where in its life story is it? Um, this is a dinosaur called Heterodontosaurus. Um, when you look at it, you want to know, is, is this, this thing is maybe three feet long, four feet long, from the tip of the snout to the tip of the tail. Is this a little dinosaur, or is it a baby dinosaur of a bigger species? So how, how would we even know which ones were the babies, which ones were the teenagers, which ones were the adults? It's easy when we're looking at um, animals like cats, right? Uh, we c it's pretty clear which one is the um, devilishly handsome kitten and which is the devilishly handsome man cat. Uh, because we can compare relative size. We can look at the, f the face, the shape of the face uh, in cats or in humans changes if you think about um, sort of the proportions of a baby's face versus an adult and we can just you know the one on the left is four weeks old and the one on the right is a year um, so we can just watch and see and, and that's the thing is we can tell the life stories of animals that are alive today because we can just watch 
watch them live their, their lives. Um, dinosaurs, if we want to tell these life stories, we have to figure out some way um, to get that, to get where in their life are they. So I'm interested in these types of questions, and ultimately, I'm interested in, in learning. Um, there are some features of their living descendants, birds, that are really different from other, um, other reptiles. So we know that birds are living descendants of dinosaurs, and dinosaurs are one kind of reptile. Uh, crocodiles are another type of reptile. T turtles are another type. All the reptiles that are alive today have very different life stories. So the crocodiles may live for 60 or 70 years. They may take 40 years to get to that full size. Some sea turtles can live well over 100 years. Tortoises can live over 100 years. Uh, most birds do not live nearly that long. Right? So we know at some point in the dinosaur family tree, they took on these features that became what we associate with bird life stories. When did that happen? Did it happen after birds became birds? Did it happen while they were still dinosaurs? Did it happen even earlier? Um, and how do the life stories change as dinosaurs evolved? So really, to get that question, we need a way to either figure out where they are in their life stage or to know what their exact age is. Now, as we're thinking about uh, modern animals, we know that bones change with age. So this is a photograph of, um, of a child who's about nine years old on the left and then an adult. And you can see um, it looks like they have you know, little lines at the ends of their bones. You've heard that kids have more bones than adults and that adults have some substantially lower number of bones in their skeleton. It's because a lot of your bones, all the long ones in your body, start out as three different bones that fuse together, and a, a long middle part and then two end caps. So it's really, that's how we do it. But the shapes of our faces, as I said before, it's not just the, f the soft tissues. Now, unfortunately for most reptiles, you see some changes, but they aren't that drastic as they get older. Maybe their snout gets a little longer, but they're not totally reshaping their face. But the insides of the bones also are changing. And it turns out that these, these trends are a little more consistent. So here is the femur, uh, the thigh bone of a three-year-old boy on there. Um, and you can see that it's got these big spaces. Those are where blood vessels run. And then it looks like um, this is an 11-year-old. Um, there's this inside part looks a lot like the outer part of the younger one. We're adding more bones to the outside. And so it gets a little more compact. And then we wind up remodeling it uh, and replacing it with little tiny circles of bone. So it turns out bone tissue changes the insides of bones. Um, and that's this, those sorts of changes are actually far more consistent uh, across different types of species than the ones that happen on the outside. So our solution, um, and, and it should, you know, you might ask, uh, our solution then is if we chop up these bones and look at those bone tissues, you know, we should be able to see what was going on and maybe see if uh, a given dinosaur would have uh, the bone tissue of a young one or an older one to sort of figure out relatively where in its life stage it is. Um, and a lot of these features that we're looking at are going to be too small for us to pick them up with a CT scanner or a CAT scanner uh, like Michelle was showing in her lab. So that's why we can't just um, look at them without, uh, without destroying them. So how do, how, what is the process of destroying a bone? Um, so you take a chunk out, you embed it in resin, just like clear polyester resin. Um, you make slices out of it on a giant saw. Um, then you mount those to a slide and then you grind them. Sort of like um, a big disc that spins with sandpaper on it. And so you just polish it thinner and thinner and thinner until it's so thin that you can see it light through a microscope. You can, th you can see it if you put light behind it and look at it under a microscope. And you get something like this. And so we're, we're looking at about a quarter of this whole. So here you can see that's the whole bone cut in half. And this is just about a quarter, you know, of, of that bone. And some things we can see the big spaces. And the big spaces are kind of towards the inside of the bone. We can also see these little lines kind of going around. And if they look like tree rings to you or if that, if that were rings to mind, they're actually the same sort of thing. So animals that are living in the wild and subject to uh, seasons, they grow sometimes fast, sometimes not at all, and they make a, a ring structure. And so we can apply that to dinosaurs, and we find the same sorts of trends. We have lots of big open spaces for blood vessels in the babies, um, and then as they get older, it gets a little more compact, and then they wind up making little circles of remodeled repair bones. So now we can kind of tell apart the babies from the teenagers, from the adults. So we can tell relatively where they are. 
Um, you, can, you can count the number of bone lines as well. We know as, a, as the animals get older, um, they can, uh, they're just going to keep adding bone to the outside. Um, and you can do, you can inject a modern animal with radioactive dye at two different times and just figure out how much bone has grown between the two days that you inject them. Um, we know that those lines in all living animals, they happen on an annual basis. So you can just say the space between line one, the innermost line, and the second, that's a year. Um, and so you can get absolute estimates of age for the time that they were growing, estimates of how uh, long they were growing per year or how much, how much uh, growth happened in a year. And you can also say if this animal and this animal are the same size, this one only has one line, and it got to the same, it did it much faster than this one that took five years to get to the same size. So you can kind of get it which ones were growing faster, not just how long their life story is, but how fast did it take them to get to that point. Um, and we can even look at this guy here where the arrows are. You can see that the amount of growth that's happening between this line and this, the amount of space of bone, is more than this and this. Basically, eventually your growth will start to slow down. So you can even tell if an animal is kind of reaching the end of its growth and slowing down. We can look at there are ways to quantify the amount of blood vessels. Animals that are very slow growing don't have a lot of blood vessels. It's these little circles here, just the channels that blood vessels ran through. And animals that grew really fast have tons of those channels and they're all interconnected. So we have other ways to tell just kind of relatively how fast these animals are growing. And we can even look at the number of bone cells. Bone cells are uh, these, little, these little things that look like pepper specks. Those are the spaces where the bone cells were in life. And so it's basically like the, a slower metabolizing animal isn't building its bones as quickly. And so it, it needs fewer workers to, to assemble its bones. Who, uh, the bone cells are the ones who are building up the bone. So an animal that's going to go very fast can, has many, many, many of these bone cells to, to assemble it. So kind of looking at our later dinosaurs, our Cretaceous dinosaurs, included some of our, our largest uh, dinosaurs ever to have lived. And we get a sense that um, a, a lot of these dinosaurs seem to have finished growing in 20 years or less, 30 years or less, and we don't, we don't think that they grew much longer or, or lived much longer than that. And when you compare them to some of the biggest reptiles that are around today, um, that is a lot different. So the biggest male alligator will grow for about 35 years and then live for another 30 years beyond that. And the, its even larger relatives of the past maybe grew for 60 years and then live for some time beyond that. So they're growing, even these dinosaurs are growing very differently than other types of reptiles. They're growing faster, so they're living faster and dying young, as opposed to other big reptiles, which are growing slow and living longer. So a turtle, like a, a giant tortoise, um, may live for 150 years. It may take 100 years to get full size. Um, all of the all of the big mammals may take five or six years, you know, for a lion to get to full size, uh, and it's certainly not going to live for 150 years. Um, and our biggest, longest living uh, mammals, like whales, um, they grow much slower. Uh, you know, for their size, they're growing a lot slower, um, and that's so. We think that there's a connection between how long it takes you to get full size, and then um, how long you can live, basically. So. When we start working back towards the past, like to see what was going on in earlier dinosaurs, it's just these giant Cretaceous animals. If we go back into the, um, if we go back into the Jurassic, this animal is uh, called Massospondylus. So this is just uh, cut right through its thigh bone, um, and we can see that we have a lot of blood vessels. So these are these are them right here. You see that? Nope. So these, that's a blood vessel. These are just channels. Um, they're basically like long, like the inside of a pipe where the blood vessel would flow, right? So they're there. So there's a lot of them. There are quite a few of these little dots, these little pepper flake looking things uh, where the bone cells were. So, and, and, it, and it turns out that none of these animals, you know, took more than 25, 30 years to get to full size. Uh, most species took a lot less. Um, and, in, and this is true for animals that lived all over, the dinosaurs that lived all over the world. So Allosaurus which is the first dinosaur um, that this sort of big study was done on. It's a Utah dinosaur and it's specimens at this museum that people analyzed. It's the same thing, so 15 years maybe to get to full size. That's a big animal, right, to get to full size that fast. It's pretty impressive. Um, so in other words, uh, to be an animal as big as an elephant or bigger, uh, it took 
you know, five years less, right? So that's, that's the kind of comparisons we're making. Um, but was this true of the, even the earliest dinosaurs? Um, so some Triassic dinosaurs, as Michelle was talking about in the last talk, look a lot like their closest non-dinosaur cousins. So we see here, here's five, four or five uh, little critters running around. They all live contemporaneously. They live at the same time, about 215 million years ago in uh, what is now New Mexico. And most of the people sitting along the back wall are scientists that uh, I've worked with uh, on this project. Um, and if you looked at all of those and said, yep, they're all dinosaurs, no one would blame you. Right, they all kind of look, you know, they have the same, except this one that's on, uh, this one that's on four legs. All the other ones kind of look more or less the same, same, same layout to their bodies, right? They're not that different in size. Uh, but not all of these, only, only these two are dinosaurs and these two are not. Um, so if we're comparing those, how does their bone tissue compare? Were they growing fast or slow? Were they growing... Uh, several years like a reptile, uh, like a lizard or, or a turtle, or they were growing fast like dinos later dinosaurs. And we're finding the same story with those, only on these guys we're not finding any of them that are growing more than, you know, five or six years. That's, I think, the tri of the Triassic ones that we've looked at from New Mexico, I think six is the most number of these growth lines that we've found. Um, we can see that they have a lot of blood vessels and, and a lot of bone cells. So this tells us something interesting is that these um, the life history of birds where they grow fast and they don't live that long is, is really just because they're dinosaurs. Right? That's what giant dinosaurs did. And that, that life story of dinosaurs, that, um, that type of life story, goes back to the very beginning. Um, and even if you start looking at some of those cousins of dinosaurs, those close cousins um, that we saw in the image a couple uh, slides ago, they're the same sort of thing. We're not seeing that many of them take more than 10 years to get full size. They may have slightly fewer of these blood vessels or bone cells, but they're still growing a lot faster than any modern reptile that isn't a bird. So we can look at this and say, yep, our earliest dinosaurs, their life story was one where they you know, lived fast and died young. And so did many of their cousins, even if their cousins were a little slower, uh, which is the case in my family. <laughs> um, <laughs> not really. Um, and, and one of the things that's helpful, too, is that we have a lot of these animals that are not that big. So a lot of the animals that we pull out of our quarries in New Mexico, you know, maybe, maybe the biggest ones would probably be able to look me in the eye, but a lot of them are a lot smaller. Some of them, like this, this little guy here, is a dinosaur cousin that about this size, right? No, no bigger than my arm's length, tip, tip the snout to the tip of the tail. Um, and when we look at it, we can see that it's a few years old, but not you know, not 30 years old. So this, these animals were definitely not babies of larger species, but they're, they're also small, small, just small animals. Um, so maybe this was just how all reptiles used to grow back in the day, back at that point. And one of the things that I found that was uh, pretty interesting is that when we started looking at all of these things that were more um, either on the croc, uh, the early ancestors of crocodilians, or um, even further back uh, in the family tree, sort of shared ancestors of, of uh, bird, birds, dinosaurs, and crocodilians, is that we see that there's a lot of variation from site to site. So we might look at a phytosaur from New Mexico and compare it with a phytosaur from Texas and a phytosaur from Colorado, and they would all have three different, very, very different life stories. So one of them might take 10 years to get to be, you know, the size of an alligator. Uh, one of them might take 30 years to get to that size. So there's a lot of variation. Um, and, and we see that in, in a lot of these species, and especially in, in some of these aquatic ones. And so there's something, something going on with those guys where the environment that we find them in, um, where that is different, their biology is also different. So their environment is influencing them. But interestingly, when we look at what's going on in, inside the dinosaur bones, the dinosaurs and their closest relatives are not showing that variation. So they're kind of hardwired uh, they're less flexible. They're only going to live fast and die young, whereas um, some of these ancestors of crocodilians and some of the, um, the, even the shared ancestors of crocodilians and dinosaurs are a lot more flexible. And whatever the conditions are in that area um, kind of seems to be influencing what their life story is. So that's, that's fairly interesting as well. Um, tomorrow we're going to hear, I think, from Dr. Whiteside. She's going to talk a little bit about 
some of the flexibility and environments and how they how they tell that. And so um, the I, the goal is for us to be able to look at where we can see evidence of climate variation to see do we see in those area do we see more um, different types of life stories for the animals that were there or do we see um, when do we see you know what conditions are there where we see more variation in these life stories. Um, so in general, just to sum up, we see a lot of evidence that dinosaurs grew fast and probably died young. Um, there's to date no dinosaur that we could see that grew over 30 years and most of them well under 20. And that's really different from the life stories of all of the large reptiles that are alive today and most of the non-dinosaur uh, large reptiles that have lived in the past. Um, their earliest dinosaurs and their close relatives grew to full size pretty fast. Um, less than 10 years, but most of them were not very large species. So just as it shouldn't surprise us that a, a cat uh, takes a year or two to get to full size, whereas we are a larger species, it takes us a few more years, that, that maybe makes sense for dinosaurs too. Um, but other large reptiles were capable of fast growth, uh, it seems, depending on their environment. So um, that's, that's all I have. So if you guys have any questions, happy to answer them.